Well, good morning, Hill Country. How y'all doing this morning? All right, you're alive and well. It's good to see you on this bright early Sunday morning, an hour loss of sleep. You guys are looking good. Just want you to know that, at least from my vantage point. I don't know what you looked like when you first woke up, but you're looking good right now. So thank you for that. If you're a guest with us, just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Mark Canada. I'm one of the pastors here, and you've picked a great week to be here because we're jumping into a brand new series this morning, and I can't wait to get started with this series. And in order for us to start well, I want to invite you to do something with me. I want to invite you just for a moment, just do this with me for a moment. I want you to think back to a time in your life when you experienced change that you didn't see coming. Can you do that with me for a moment? I want you to think back to a time in your life where you experienced change that you never saw coming. Maybe it was a surprise birthday party and you got there and you had no idea it was about ready to happen and it just blew your mind. You couldn't believe it. Or maybe it was the day that you got engaged and you just had no idea it was coming. You just were just so blown away by the fact that someone would actually ask you to marry them. And maybe that just blew your mind away. Or maybe there was a moment in your life where you lost a loved one and you never saw it coming. Or maybe the opposite of that. Maybe you as a couple found out you were about ready to have a child and you just, you just didn't know that that was about ready to come into your life. Or maybe for you, you lost your job that you've had for years and you just had no idea that that was what was about ready to come around the corner. Have you ever had a moment like that? Where change came into your life that you never saw coming? I'll never forget 10 years ago when our daughter Kate was born into this world. One of the things that people would always say to us right before Kate was born was like, hey, just so you know, like things are about ready to change. And I remember they would like say this over and over to us. And I remember thinking like, come on, like it's not going to be that big of a deal. Like, it's not going to change that much. Like, we're going to still be able to do the things that we love. We're going to still be able to go to the places that we want to go to. We're going to be able to go to the bed when we want to go to bed. We're going to get up when we want to be able to get up. Like, all the normal things. Like, I thought that would be just the normal occurrence. But I'll never forget the day she was born, because when she was born, I remember being in the hospital, and in the hospital, there was this amazing thing in the hospital, at least where we had her, is that different times throughout the day, the nurses would come in, and they would wheel her off to this nursery so that we could actually get some sleep. And I thought, well, that's pretty nice. But then I remember we got home. And when we got home, here was the one of the things, is that my mother-in-law was actually going to be traveling to spend some time with us to help us out when we first had her. And I remember when we were in the hospital, I called her and I said, hey, mom, look, like, I just want you to hold off a little bit in coming. Like, we just need to have a couple of days, like, special, just as a family, to just have this kind of time to, like, you know, bond together. And then we had the first night. And we didn't sleep at all. And I remember I got on the phone with her the next morning and I said, you need to get here now. You need to get here right now because our world had changed, right? You know that. Like, when you have children, your world gets turned upside down and it's amazing and it's challenging and it's good and it's difficult but change comes, and it comes in ways that you never would have expected it. Now, how do you typically respond to change that you never saw coming? What does it look like for you? How do you react? What does it feel like for you? And does it look like this at all? Why don't you guys check out this video? What do you want me to ask for? Bigger. <laughs> There's a clue in your bag. Look in your bag, Gavin. Are you no. What is it? Is that how you react to change when it comes? Right? Like, sometimes we have different responses based off of our personalities and the way that we're wired, right? Which one are you? Which way do you react when it comes to change? 
Because the reality of change is that it's inevitable. It's going to happen at some point in our lives. And how you manage change, and you know this is true, how you manage change and when it comes into your life will have a dramatic impact on your life because change is inevitable. And one thing that's certain is that change is either in the middle of your life right now, it's about ready to come into your life, or you've just gotten out of a significant season of change. And this is true of all of us because change is something that happens to us whether we like it or not, whether it's part of our personality, whether it's something that we long for or it's something that we resist. It's something that's just part of all of life as we all experience different seasons of change. And how you manage it, and you know this is true, how you manage it will have a dramatic impact on your life. Now just do this with me for a moment. Think back to the moment you graduated high school, if you've done that already. Think back to that moment. I know for some of you, this is just a few years ago, and for others of you, this is like a really long time ago, okay? So whatever it is, just think back to that moment. And in that moment, change entered your life. For some of you, that change produced a desire or a parent's pushing or whatever it may be to go off to college. And you got a college education, and as you went to college, there were decisions that you made that changed the trajectory of your life in the season of that change. Or maybe for some of you, you decided not to go to college and go right to work. Those decisions that changed and how you managed that change had an impact on your life. Some of you went off to the military. Some of you got married right away and started having children. Some of you are still living at your parents' house to this day, and you're still trying to figure out what to do with that change, but you managed it. Whether you're still living there or not, you are in the process of managing that change, and we all react to change in some way, shape, or form. I love what Benjamin Franklin said. He said it like this, when you are finished changing, you're finished. Isn't that true? Because this is true of all of us. All of us experience different seasons of change. And so that means if you are a living, breathing, breathing, human being, change is coming your way. And so the question that you and I need to ask ourselves today is simply this, is are we prepared for it? Are you ready for whatever change is coming your way? Are you prepared for the change that may come around the corner tomorrow and you're going to have to deal with it? Now I want you to do something just one more time and I want you to just think back. And I want you to think about a moment in history that changed our world. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this moment changed your life. I want you to think about the day that Jesus was crucified. And then I want you to back up about 15 hours to the night before it actually took place. You see, in that moment, Jesus had gathered together with his closest followers, his closest friends, the 12 disciples. And these are the guys who had been with him for the last three years. They'd seen him heal the sick. They'd watched him cast out demons. They'd seen him debate with the religious leaders of his day. They'd seen him raise the dead and forgive sins of people. And in this moment, he gathered with them. Again, 15 hours before he's crucified, he's gathered with them in an upstairs room. And what he's in the process or about ready to do is to prepare them for a dramatic change that they're about ready to experience in just a few hours. Now, he had told them, and if you've read the Gospels, you know this, he told them many times about the change that was coming. He had told them he he was going to be handed over to the religious leaders, that he would be tortured and beaten and crucified, and that he would rise again. And he had told the disciples this multiple times, but they hadn't gotten it. They hadn't understood. They didn't fully comprehend what this change would actually look like. And John, the disciple John, who he refers to himself as the one who Jesus loved, was an eyewitness of this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room. Not only was he an eyewitness, he experienced what was happening in that room, and he recorded for us in John chapters 13 through 17 what took place. This change that Jesus was preparing his disciples for. This change that Jesus wanted to make sure his disciples understood so that they they could walk through it effectively. And what we're going to be doing over the next five weeks as we prepare our minds and hearts to celebrate what Jesus accomplished on the cross and then from rising from the dead, what we're going to be doing over these next five weeks is we're going to be investigating this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. 
we're going to be taking a deeper dive and trying to understand what it was that he was trying to communicate, what he was, what he was trying to do for them to help expose them to, to open their minds up to be able to walk through change effectively. And it was a change that would not only change them, but it would change the course of history. Now, I want to tell you this. If you're someone who's still kind of investigating Jesus, you're not sure what you believe about Jesus, I want you to know that these five chapters that we're going to be looking at over these next five weeks are chapters that are specifically written, specifically spoken to disciples, people who are followers of Jesus. And I want to warn you about something if you're still investigating Jesus, is please do not check out because you don't feel like this is written to you. If anything, I want you to lean in if you're still investigating Jesus, because as you look at these five chapters, you're going to get to see Jesus in a very unique way. You're going to see him do things that are unique to Jesus. You're going to see him say things that are worth your time to investigate and evaluate what it is that you really, really believe about Jesus. So as we begin this series, what I want to invite you to do is to turn with me, tap with me, click with me, whatever you need to do to get over to John chapter 13, verse 1, because that's where we're going to start with this conversation, with this experience, with this environment that Jesus is creating for his disciples the night before he goes to be crucified. And I want to invite you to lean into what God has for us today, because I believe that as we lean into what Jesus is going to say, it has the potential to change our lives as we walk through and experience times of change. So here we go. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Here's what it says. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now I've got to ask you this. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you've been preparing for, practicing for, or trying to just get ready for something that you knew was out there on the periphery, but it was coming. Do you remember what that moment felt like? Do you remember the training, the preparation, the practice? Well, many of you know that I love football. I played football growing up. I love watching football. And since moving to Texas, I've become, and my family's become a huge, become huge Texas Longhorns fans, except my daughter, Nora, who's five. There have been some friends of ours who've had a diabolical plan to convert her, her to be an Aggie. And she says she's an Aggie fan. And so if any of you do that, I don't appreciate that. But she says she's an Aggie. But one of the things I love about watching football, if you've ever watched football, you'll see this typically when a team or teams get to the fourth quarter. When the fourth quarter begins, typically all the players and the coaches on the field begin to raise their hands up, and it looks like this. And what I love about that moment when they're raising their hands like this is it doesn't matter who's winning. It doesn't matter who's losing. But what it means is that this is it. Like we're coming into the last quarter and this is what matters. This is what all of our training's been for. This is what all of our preparation's been for. This is why we've practiced and bled and sweat the way that we have because this is it. We don't want to leave anything behind. We want to put everything we have out on the field. We want to give it our all. And right here in this moment, in John chapter 13, what Jesus says, this is exactly what's happening right here in this moment for him. Did you see what he, what he said? He said his hour has come. His purpose for being born, to love this world by dying for the sins of the world, for yours and for mine, has come. Jesus realizes that it's the fourth quarter and he's going to specifically be showing and giving an example of his love to the disciples. And he's going to love them to the very end. And he's not going to leave anything out. He's going to love them with everything that he has. So how's he going to do that? Look at verse 2 where he says this. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Please don't miss. So let's pause here. Don't miss 
what just happened in verse 3, because this is really, really important. Look back at verse 3. It says this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things, not some things, all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God. You see, the Father had given all things into Jesus' hands, which means Jesus, the Son of God, has supreme authority. He has all the power. He has the highest rank. There is no one that can compare to him. There's no one that can match his power and authority because he has the highest rank possible. And with all of that power, and with all of that authority and position, Jesus does the unthinkable. Jesus models true love by sacrificially serving others. He had all the power and all the authority. And he does the unthinkable. You see, for the Jewish disciples who are watching Jesus in this moment, you see, they've been taught their whole life that feet were some of the most dishonorable members of the body. And they were dishonorable because they were usually dirty. And they would have put your 15-year-old son's feet to shame by how they smelled. Like, it was bad. And for, for the majority of them, when they thought about the feet, they thought they couldn't come into contact with the feet because the, the feet came into contact with the things the law declared unclean. And so they were dishonorable. And no one would have washed them except for maybe the immediate family or a servant or a slave would have washed them. But here is Jesus. Don't miss this image. Jesus, the Son of God, whom the Father had given all things into his hands, and he's stripped down like a common slave with a towel around his waist, and he is willingly washing 24 individual feet with all the junk, all the grime, and all the uncleanliness, one by one. And two of those feet were the feet of a man who would just betray him in just a few hours. And there he is in the posture of a servant, a slave. And this was completely backwards. This is so backwards. And his disciples knew it was backwards. Look at what it says in verse 6. It says, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never, you shall never wash my feet. You see, Peter doesn't want to subject Jesus to such a dishonor. So he says to him, you're never going to wash my feet, Jesus. Like, don't even think about it. You would never stoop that low. You can't do that to me. Don't do it, Jesus. And Jesus responds to him and he says this. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me, Peter. Now, Peter must have been stunned by this statement because what Peter was trying to do, he was trying to preserve the honor of Jesus. But what Jesus is saying to him is, unless you allow me to bear your dishonor, unless you allow me to bear your uncleanliness, you cannot be my disciple. Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your sin away, if you don't allow me to cleanse you, you will have no part of me. And I love how Peter responds in verse 9. He says, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Like, wash all of me. I love Peter. He's so extreme. And he opens his mouth so quickly, but that's what Peter does. And Jesus, seeing this moment, I'm sure, looked at him with love and care. Because here Peter is confused at what Jesus is doing, and Jesus loves Peter. That's why he swooped down like a servant and a slave. But look at what Jesus does next in verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Do you see what's happening right here? 
Do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus knows that in less than 24 hours, he's going to be hanging on a cross. And his disciples' world is going to be turned upside down. They're not going to know their right from their left. They're going to be so disoriented by what happens to him. Because that's what change has a tendency to do, right? Change has this amazing reality of creating disorientation in our lives, especially when it's change that we don't expect. And when we become confused or disoriented from change, you know what we have a tendency to do? We have a tendency to react or revert to what is familiar or easy. We do this all the time. We react or we revert to what's familiar and easy. And one of the things that we do when change comes into our lives, at least this is what's so common, is we just try and mirror or model that which is around us. We look at what other people are doing in order to gain some kind of stability, and we just copy what they do. And the world that the disciples lived in, and the world that we live in, will say that success is when you have power, success is when you have authority, success is when you have control, And because of that power, authority, and control, people will serve you. And if we're not careful, one of the easiest things to do when we get into a period of change is we will try and define greatness, we will try and define success, we will try and define our lives like the rest of the world does. But Jesus is saying, guys, I have a different example for you to follow. And it looks very different than what this world has to offer. And what he does is the exact opposite of what this world does. And Jesus invites, he invites the disciples to actually follow his example. To follow his example of what true love and greatness looks like. A true love that actually sacrificially serves others. And so Jesus says to his disciples, he says, do you see? Do you see what I've just done for you? Now I want you to go and actually put it into practice. I want to invite you to humble yourself, become a servant, and actually put the needs of others in front of your own. I want you to remove your entitlement and preferences for the sake of other people. So how's that going for you? I'm not talking about disciples, I'm talking about you. How's that going for you? How's it going being humble? How's it going putting others' needs in front of your own? How's it going putting your preferences and the things that you feel entitled to, to the side. There was a time recently where I was upstairs in our home with my wife, and one of the things that we do at nighttime when we put our kids to bed is we take some time and we read the Bible with them, and we spend time praying with them. And it's a special moment where we do this. And typically what will happen is my wife will take a little bit longer, like singing and doing some of that stuff with our kids, and I'll come down first come downstairs. And so there's this one night I came downstairs and I looked in our family room in the kitchen and there was some stuff that really needed to be put away. And you know what went through my mind? She'll probably take care of that. And you know what I did? And I'm not proud of this. I'm just being honest. I picked up the remote and I sat on the couch and I turned the TV on. That's what I did. So when I ask you the question, how's this going for you? That question stings for me because I often fall short with being a sacrificial sacrificial servant like Jesus asked us to be. I don't know if that's true for you, but I know it is for me. I can so easily fall into being entitled. I can so easily fall into thinking that my way is more important. I can so easily fall into just thinking about myself rather than actually loving other people like Jesus modeled for us. How about you? Like that question's meant to sting a little bit. Because we can all fall into this. This is hard. You know, this is one of those things like you can read in Scripture and say like, yeah, that's good. Like, that, that's nice. <laughs> right? Like you read it and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Like, and you just keep moving. Well, look at what Jesus says next in verse 21. He says, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, that's John, was reclining at table with Jesus at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus, of whom is he speaking? So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. 
So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Have you ever had to love a difficult person before? Have you ever had someone in your life where you know, like when you get around them, you're really going to have to think about how you respond? You're going to have to really think about like what you're going to say or not say. You're going to think about like where you position yourself to sit or not sit. You know that when you get around them, everything inside of you tenses up because you know what that person is going to bring out of you. You know what I'm talking about? You can probably see their face right now. And if they're sitting next to you, I'm really sorry. But you know, you know what, I'm, you know what I mean? Now, I'm imagining that that person has never tried to betray you to kill you. I'm just imagining I'm, I'm, because you're still here. But think about that for Jesus for a moment. Here Jesus is washing the feet of the person who's about ready to betray him to death. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine doing that? What emotions would be running through you if you know that person was about ready to betray you to death? But here Jesus is sacrificially serving the one who's about ready to betray him to death. Now look back at what it says in verses 18 through 19. It says, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Verse 19, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Now what Jesus is doing right here is he is setting an example of radical, extravagant love. Jesus knew that the scriptures written about him and what would take place must be fulfilled. So in love, he serves Judas And in love, he obeys the Father, even when it was really, really hard. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? Because he was still serving the disciples. In this moment, he was still serving you and me. Look at verse 19. Look back what it says. He says, I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, here it is, that you may believe that I am he. He was serving Judas in this way so that when we would read of what would happen after, we would believe so that the disciples would believe. He was doing this servant, sacrificial love so that people would believe. And you know what's true about love? Is that true love always requires sacrifice. When it's true love, it will always require a level of sacrifice. Are you a person like that? Do you love through sacrifice? Do you sacrifice in order to love? Do you follow Jesus' example even when it's hard? Is there a person in your life right now? Or are there people in your life right now that Jesus has been inviting you to love like he loves? What's their name? Do you know what their name is? Maybe the reason that you're here today is because you or I need to hear Jesus' words when he says, follow my example. Do you need to hear that today from Jesus when it comes to the person that just came up into your mind? Follow my example. Just as I have done for you, you go and do likewise. Is that you today? Look at what Jesus says next in verse 33. Little children, yet a little while and I am with you. You will seek me just as I said to the Jews. So now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. What Jesus has done right here in this passage, he's done two things. First, he's given a warning. And second, he's given a commandment. Did you see it? Look back at what he says. Here's the warning. He says, hey guys, listen up. Here's what's about ready to happen. I'm about ready to leave you. There's the change. Even though he's told them about this before, they're not fully comprehending it. And so he's gonna go after it again. Guys, listen, I'm about ready to leave you. Change is about ready to come into your life that you don't expect. There's the warning, but here's the command. You are to love one another as I have loved you. 
in the middle of the change that you're about ready to experience, in the middle of my absence and me leaving you, you are to love one another as I have loved you. And this isn't just some kind of nice thought from Jesus. This isn't just some kind of like polite suggestion. It's actually a command. You are to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus actually commands his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. You see, if you are going to be a disciple of Jesus, that means that you are going to model and pattern your life after him. That's what it means to be a disciple, that you follow him, not just in word, but the way you live your life. And when you hear that, at least when I hear things like that, sometimes I think like, that's impossible. That's impossible to have that kind of attitude all the time. It's impossible to take the form of a servant, and sacrificially serve one another. It's impossible to love my enemies like Jesus loved. It's impossible to put others first like he did. And if that's the way you're thinking right now, I want you to know that I'm really happy that you're thinking like that because you're right. It is absolutely impossible to follow Jesus' example like that on our own. And when we get to chapter 15 in this series, Jesus is going to help us see that apart from him, we can't do anything of eternal value. And so I want to encourage you, keep tracking with us with this series, because if you're at a place in your life where you feel helpless and you look at Jesus and think that modeling him is impossible, you're right. And I want you to keep tracking so that we can know where this power, where this ability comes from, because Jesus is going to show us. But whether we are capable or not, the command remains the same. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, i got to ask you this question. Why do you think Jesus took these final moments, these precious last moments with his disciples to make such a big deal about this? Why does he take these moments, these minutes, these just this short period of time to be able to model and say what he's saying? Why is he making such a big deal about this? Why does it matter? Look at verse 35 because he answers that. By this, all people, don't miss this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I want you to feel the weight of that statement for just a moment. Do you feel the weight of that statement? By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Do you feel the heaviness of that statement? The way that you treat one another will reveal to the world if you really belong to Jesus. And the way you treat one another will reveal Jesus to the world. This actually matters, not just a little bit, but a lot. You see, Jesus will be made known by the love his disciples have for one another. Would you just think about that for a moment? Our love for one another will not tell anyone about Jesus if it's not lived out in front of other people. It won't. Because of our weakness, our love has a tendency to become isolated and to stay in-house. Commenting on this verse, Marshall Siegel says this, Jesus wasn't casting a vision for a glorified clique when he spoke to his disciples that night. He spoke about a contagious love that compels people to come and see. Now let's just take a moment and take an honest look within. Would you do that? Would you take an honest look within yourself? Are you known as a disciple of Jesus because of your love for other people? Are you known by your love? Do your friends, do your relatives, your acquaintances, your neighbors, and your coworkers notice something different about you? If we were to go and have a conversation with them, would they have any kind of comment about how your life reflects the love of Jesus? When you open your mouth and speak, does it reflect the love of Jesus? When you post on social media or comment on social media, does it reflect the love of Jesus, when you drive your car on Mopac, does it reflect the love of Jesus? When you interact with people here at church among the body, 
Does it actually reflect the love of Jesus? When you interact with people who don't know Jesus or believe differently than you, does it reflect the love of Jesus? How about just us collectively as a church for a moment? Are we known as Hill Country Bible Church Pflugerville? Are we known because of our love for Jesus? Are we known because of our love for one another? And is Jesus being made known because of that love? Is that true of us? Now, I got to tell you, one of the things I know is we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But you know what I love about this church in the short time that I've been here? You know what I'm proud of? Is I believe that this is true of you. I believe that this is true of us. You see, this church, this body, you, the church, not a building, but you, the people, have a history of loving one another well. And I get to see this, and we see this lived out on a weekly basis. It happens at 6 a.m. every Sunday morning when Christina Dowler comes in to make coffee for everyone. It happens every week in our children's, student, men's, women's ministries, every single week when we interact with one another and we care for one another and show compassion for one another. It happens every single week in our real life groups when we pursue Jesus together and hold each other accountable and go after the things of God that really matter for the sake of eternity. It happens every single week. And that is why some of you have said, you know what, I want this to be my home because you have seen the love of Jesus in a tangible way and you don't want to go anywhere else because it's present and it's here. And I don't know about you, but I'm proud to be a part of a place like that. But you know what also I love about this place? Is that love isn't just tangible right here among us, but it's actually gone out of here. It's not stayed within these walls, but it's been launched out into this community. Do you realize that on a weekly basis, you are involved in serving this community in Greater Austin and Pflugerville and in Round Rock? Like you're actually making a difference by how you treat people. And it happens every single week. Disciples are being made. The gospel is going out. Churches are being planted. Missionaries are being sent out. Like this is happening not just internally, but externally. And I don't know about you, but I get excited and proud to be a part of a family, to be a part of a community, to be a part of a movement who takes Jesus at his word and actually puts it into practice. And that's what we get to be a part of. But you know what? Just because it's true of us now does not guarantee that it'll be true of us then. Let me say that again. Just because it's true of us now does not mean it will be true of us then. Because you know what change does? Change disorients us. And when change comes, it can be incredibly difficult. But here's what change does, is change will always, it will always create an opportunity to live a life of love. And so while that may be true of us now, as change happens, it's going to create more opportunities for us to live a life of love. Here's the reality. (laughs) The coronavirus may spread. Who you want to be elected as the next president may or may not happen. Tornadoes may spring up like they did in Nashville this past week. Change is going to come. You may keep your job for the rest of your life or you may lose it next week. Someone you love dearly may pass away and you know what? You may be able to have a child. Change is going to come and change will always, it will always create an opportunity to live a life of love. And Jesus is showing us right here in John chapter 13, 13 what real love looks like. And he is commanding you, and he's commanding me to cling, to cling to that love, to model that love, to love one another, to love this world to make a difference because of the love that we have for one another and for Jesus. So what could this week look like? Think about this with me for a moment. What could this week look like if we were to put into practice what Jesus has commanded? What could it look like this week to live and to love like Jesus? What could it look like this week to give away time, money, or energy? Because God knows 
everything that we need? What could it look like this week to cancel plans in order to spend time with someone who's lonely? What could it look like this week to initiate a hard conversation with someone out of love that you know you've been needing to have? What could it look like this week to share Jesus with someone that you know He's been putting on your heart to share Him with? What could it look like this week to invite someone into a what's after ATX conversation because you care about where they spend eternity? What could it look like this week to set aside your preferences for someone else who has different desires? What could it look like this week to consider someone's interests above your own? What could it look like? You see, if God himself was willing in love to wash feet and eventually go to the cross for us, why would we refuse to lower ourselves in love for one another? You see, love sets aside social status. Love sets aside cultural norms. Love sets aside the comfort of convenience to joyfully meet the inconvenient needs of others. That's the kind of love that looks and smells like Jesus. The sinless Savior on his knees before the sinful people he came to save. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we just want to thank you right now that not only did you tell us what love is and looks like, but you modeled it for us. You gave us an example of what it looks like, not only by taking the form of a sacrificial servant and washing feet, but by dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus, you've commanded us to go and do the same. And so, Jesus, would you help us to do that? We need your help. We can't do it on our own. And God, we know why this matters. This matters so much because it glorifies you. It shows the world who you are. And so, Jesus, this week, would you help us not just to know who you are and know what you've done, but would you help us to follow your example? Jesus, thank you for what you've done on our behalf. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.